Yeah, I think before we start, what, as, as Mia said, is, is a very uh, important discussion on the situation in Cuba. It's important to outline from which standpoint we approach this, this situation. And that is that we stand unconditionally in defense of the Cuban revolution against the attacks of imperialism and reaction. And we do so because the revolution was a tremendous step forward for the masses of Cuba. And in the struggle against imperialism and capitalism, not just on the island, but in Latin America and indeed the world, Cuba in the 1950s may not have been the poorest country in the region, but it was getting poorer as a consequence of US imperialism. So US corporations owned 40% of Cuba's sugar producing land, 80% of its mines and mineral resources, 90% of its utilities, and the entire oil refinery industry. And these statistics aren't quoted by the revolution, they're quoted by JFK, the president at the time of the, the radicalization of the revolution. And this economic domination laid the basis for political domination on the island by its aggressive northern neighbor, which militarily intervened in the island in 1906 to 1909, in 1912, and 1917 to 1923, under the terms of something that was called the Platt Amendment, which is effectively an amendment that the US forced onto the Cuban constitution at the founding of the Republic in 1901, um, which basically uh, gave the legal cover for the US to intervene in the island should its interests be compromised. And whilst this amendment was repealed as a consequence of the 1933 revolution, in reality, it was still in force, right? In, in reality, the US continued to dominate the island. And this was seen actually uh, immediately after the, the revolution, when the US ambassador, Sumner Wells, uh, basically continued to call the shots. And he called for the overthrow of the petty bourgeois revolutionary government of Grau San Martin, which was carried out dutifully by uh, Batista, who would go on to become dictator of the island uh, in the 1950s. And so US domination effectively made Cuba a colony, and, it, and this was disastrously the case for the island's, uh, for the island's uh, economy. Basically, US domination uh, maintained and deepened the colonial nature of the island's uh, economy, which was based on the, on the production and export of a few key agricultural crops like coffee, sugar, and tobacco, and so on. And, uh, and, this, and this left it very vulnerable to the, to the fluctuations of the world market, and it held back uh, the development of an industrial base uh, on the island. And in the 1950s, uh, the main export of Cuba, which was sugar, that the world prices for sugar were uh, plummeted as a consequence of new producers entering the market. Like, for instance, uh, Ghana entered the world market for the first time because it was no longer just producing sugar for, uh, for Britain as it was in, in the colonial period. And this led to a profound crisis uh, on the island and a complete collapse uh, in living standards and a sharp decline of, of GDP uh, per capita. Uh, and, this, and this crisis led to there being 700,000 people permanently unemployed, which is a, a chronic unemployment of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, and many more were underemployed because the dominance of the sugar industry meant that most workers in Cuba only worked for four months uh, during the harvest season of sugar and were left to languish in idle poverty uh, for the rest of it. And perversely, uh, you know, America treated the, the, the uh, mineral resources, the scarce mineral resources uh, on the island as a, as a strategic reserve, and so left them deliberately underdeveloped. Uh, and, and this, in, in, as well as the, the, uh, the monstrous oppression of women that imperialist domination reinforced, meant that in 1958, Cuba had more registered prostitutes than it did mine workers. And so when we talk about the fact that, you know, the US used Cuba as a brothel, it's not just, a, you know, a, a, a in a rhetoric or a rhetorical flourish. This was the reality uh, for the island. And of course, much of this poverty and unemployment acutely affected the Afro-Cuban population, who were also victims of intense racism and segregation. And the revolution in Cuba swept uh, so much of this away. It completely over overturned this rotten situation. And it was a deep and popular revolution because of course it's known like, that the guerrilla army led the struggle and that is undoubtedly true. But this was a very deeply popular revolution that mobilized the masses in every key city and town to overthrow uh, the regime. The Batista dictatorship. And what were the achievements of this revolution? The revolution immediately alleviated the position of poor tenants by cutting rent by as much as 50% and making it illegal for landlords to evict their tenants. By June 1959, Fidel Castro set up the, the National Institute for Agrarian Reform to carry out uh, the redistribution of large landing, land holdings to, to landless peasants who would receive uh, 67 acres of land each. And this was a major step forward for those landless peasants who were the victims of the fluctuation 
limitations of, of, of the sugar industry, who, who, that, that layer that was drawn temporarily into work and then forced into idle poverty for the rest of the year. And, and, but of course, these reforms were not welcomed by Cuba's bourgeois. They were fiercely opposed to it. And it was met with, with, with intense opposition on the island from that ruling class that looked immediately to US imperialism for its salvation. And so by 1960, the Cuban Revolution was at a crossroads as the opposition of the ruling class backed by the US uh, and, and so on only intensified. The choice was to back down and betray the masses, reversing the bourgeois democratic reforms that had been implemented, or to go further. And it is to the credit of Castro and Guevara that they chose the latter. In doing so, they nationalized vast swathes of the economy in October 1960 that heralded the ending of capitalism on the island on the basis of economic planning. And it was from this basis that land reform was guaranteed and extended and, and landowners weren't compensated, the land was expropriated from them. It was on this basis that properties were handed over to long-standing tenants and landlordism on the island was abolished. But more gains were made possible by the expropriation of capitalist property. It was on this basis that the enormous strides forward in healthcare and education had been made. And, and it was also on this basis that Cuba guaranteed real and genuine self-determination and a break with US imperialism. You know, in healthcare, the island has just under nine doctors per 1,000 citizens, which is the highest rate in the world. And that has enabled them to achieve a life expectancy of 80, which is higher than that of the United States. In education, Cuba boasts nearly universal literacy, whilst Cubans can obtain a doctorate degree uh, at no expense to themselves. And, and, and on the question of, of, of the transformation of the situation for Afro-Cubans, they were able to immediately eliminate many of the racist impositions that faced uh, Afro-Cubans before, because by taking the hands of the economy out of capitalists and into the hands of the state, the Ministry of Labor was immediately able to abolish the color bar that existed that barred Afro-Cubans from, from working in most of the skilled industries, and therefore the immediate transformation of the situation enabled Afro-Cubans to enter skilled work for the first time in the, in the island's history. And this Made, this was an enormous step forward. And of course, also, it, there was an immediate end to the segregation that existed on the island. And it's an interesting aside that it was, a, you know, it was the, the white uh, kind of a son of a Spanish immigrant that put forward this program that, that emancipated the Afro-Cubans of the island when a mulatto president, Batista, had failed to do so. He was barred from entering certain clubs in his own island. And it was precisely because what matters is not this idea of representation, but the political program that is pursued. And it was a revolutionary political program that Castro uh, had, you know, based himself on. And so these enormous gains of the Cuban revolution are the reason why there's a continued deep support for it, which was displayed in the, in the protests that emerged and in counter to the ones that, that, that emerged on July 11th, the, the protests in support of the revolution. And so now we have to outline those events, what happened on that kind of infamous day of July 11th. So protests broke out in, in San Antonio de los Baños, which is a small town uh, near Havana, uh, where, where protesters were demanding an end to, to the blackouts, which are afflicting the town uh, for up to six hours a day. And I'll come on to the reasons for that as, as to why, why they've emerged. And also we're calling, we're calling for vaccines as well to, to, to be vaccinated, basically placing <laughs> demands on the local uh, uh, administration. But of course, these protests, which were of a genuine character, quickly spread through the rest of the islands where the content of the demonstrations became much more openly counter-revolutionary with slogans being raised such as Patria y Vida, which is, you know, homeland and life, which is the counter slogan to the, the slogan of the revolution, which is Patria Muerte Venceremos. Um, and also other slogans like down with the dictatorship and so on were heard at many of these protests. And these were quickly spread over social media networks, which are the kind of the, the, the means and the weapons of, of the counter-revolution in Cuba to spread uh, misinformation and so on, which I'll come on to. Now, these protests were, you know, mark a, a very important uh, transformation in the situation, of course. Uh, the scale of the protests really, uh, they're the largest since uh, the Malacanazo of 1994, which took place at the height of the special period uh, when Cuba's economy shrank by 35% as a consequence of the collapse of the USSR and the intensification of the blockade. Even still, I think it's worth bearing in mind that these protests amounted at most to 2,000 people in a city of 3 million in Havana, for instance. And so we can't compare them to the mass movements that we've seen developing and breaking out all across Latin America. They're on a completely different scale. 
And, but nonetheless, we have to have a, a very serious attitude as, as to how such a, a, an event was, was able to emerge. And of course, there are very real uh, objective conditions of hardship. There are shortages of key commodities uh, in the island. There are regular blackouts, as, as I mentioned. There is intense inflation, in part as a consequence of these shortages, but also policies pursued by the, by the government itself, which I'll come on to. And of course, there's also this question of the, of the vaccination program being hindered. Now, Cuba has been able to develop its own, its own vaccine, which is a, a testament to the triumph of economic planning. But nonetheless, because of, the, because of certain impositions of the blockade, it's not even able to import uh, the necessary syringes and so on that it requires to, thank you, that are, that it's, that are required to, to vaccinate the population. And so that, that you know, led to the fact they have the vaccines, but they're unable uh, to distribute them quickly enough and so on. Although this now has, has, has transformed. But at this period, this was the, this was the situation. And so the, this, this laid basically the very fertile ground for the intrigues of US imperialism, right? These are the very real hardships that Cubans uh, were facing. But I'll now come on to these, these intrigues. So, so there's something that comrades might have heard of called the, the SOS Cuba campaign, uh, which involves these, these deliberate distortions and exaggerations of the situation and a deliberate and concerted effort uh, to, to turn the Cuban people against uh, the revolution and so on. So for instance, in, in Matanzas, which is an important uh, province just east of Havana, uh, uh, the one example I, I found was that lies were spread that the Cuban government was planning to attack a daycare center and then blame it on protesters as, as some sort of false flag operation. And this is the kind of absurdity, the lens to which this this uh, this smear campaign goes to. And of course, these are designed to, to, to as I say, break Cubans away from the revolution uh, by you know by take by basically saying that this real hardship you face it's the, it's the fault uh, entirely of this of this revolution. And this has, of course, been the policy of the United States for a very long, uh, long period, which I'll come on to uh, in, in a second. But I think it's also important to point out uh, that the, the rank hypocrisy of this campaign, with celebrities and politicians, you know, in, across Cuba, but also across uh, the United States and so on, sh uh, shedding crocodile tears about the mortality rates in Cuba, when they've not commented once on the situation in Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, where the rate is far, far worse. You know, when you, when you look at this, for instance, Cuba is an island of roughly 11 million people, uh, where unfortunately 8,201 people have died as a, as a consequence of, of COVID-19. But in Ecuador, which is a nation of roughly 17 million people, we've seen about 31,870 deaths. It's clearly far worse than the situation in Cuba. Yet there's no call for humanitarian intervention in that country, and we know the reason why. And of course, I think the real attitude of the SOS Cuba campaign, the real attitude of American imperialism was summed up eloquently by Jose Marti, the national hero of Cuba who struggled against uh, Spanish uh, domination of the island in the, towards the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Um, as he put it, never, except as an idea hidden away in the depths of some generous souls, was Cuba anything more to the United States <clears throat> than a desirable possession whose only inconvenience is its population, which it considers to be unruly, lazy, and worthy of scorn. This is the real attitude of US imperialism that cannot accept the, the, the fact that Cuba was able to break free from its domination and provide a beacon of hope and optimism that an alternative society is possible. And as I say, this is a long, there's a long history of this, of course. Uh, for instance, uh, comrades might not be aware that there's a program that's been in, uh, in, in America since the 1960s, uh, known as Cubanology, where the CIA basically provides money to academics to deliberately distort their analysis of the Cuban revolution in history, economics, sociology, and so on. Uh, you know, it, recently it was, it was revealed that an extra $20 million uh, had been requested to conduct this, this smear campaign under, you know, this SOS Cuba campaign, and so on, and US policy, of, as I said, it's always been about undermining this revolution, uh, to the point, obviously, of, of, of you know, as we know, the embargo, which I'll come on to, uh, and so on, the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, but also the, uh, the more covert measures like Operation Mongoose, which saw uh, the, the Americans uh, basically launch terrorist attacks against Cuba, like which involved things like blowing up uh, various port facilities, um, but also like you know just trying to spread pesticides uh, on, onto the island to, to, to destroy crops and so on. All of these different measures to undermine uh, the revolution and basically uh, bring about a, yeah an, an overthrow of the, of the revolutionary government.
But of course, this has always been the case, right? Ever since the revolution dared to challenge US domination, America has done its utmost to overthrow it. But there haven't always been these mass protests against the revolution. It hasn't always uh, provoked that kind of response. Uh, and so it's important that we don't simply leave our level of analysis to say it's all at the door of imperialism. Because of course, this plays a vital role, but this, doesn't, this isn't enough. Why now? Why have protests broken out uh, on the island? And I think really, if we were to leave the discussion at this point, that's really the, the level of analysis of, of, of the Stalinists and the, and the friendly reformists who do no good for the revolution. I think as revolutionaries, it's our duty to thoroughly understand the situation and humbly offer uh, our advice on, on which way forward. So I think now it's, 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 it's important to turn to, to what has brought about this crisis. And of course, there are myriad factors that have, that have brought Cuba to this situation, some more important and decisive than others. Uh, you know, chief among the causes for Cuba's hardship is undoubtedly the blockade. Um, so for instance, in 2020, Cuba submitted to the United Nations that the embargo had cost them $5.57 billion from April 2019 to March 2020. And for context of what this means for the island, the total food imports into Cuba in the same period amounted to about $2 billion. So this is the scale of the losses as a consequence of, of this criminal blockade. And of course, without a significant manufacturing base, Cuba must import a, the vast majority of the commodities it consumes. And this puts Cuba's planned economy in a completely unbalanced situation with respect to its relationship to the world market. And of course, this is, is a consequence ultimately also of Cuba's relationship with the Soviet Union. Now, of course, this was not the same. There's, there's this misunderstanding that, that basically the revolution led Cuba to trade US domination for Soviet domination. I think this is false and completely misunderstands uh, the relationship. Because, of course, the relationship that America had with Cuba, which was to, was to extract all it could from the island, and it was a very different relationship that Cuba had with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union actually gave favorable terms of trade to, to Cuba, for instance, so that it would buy sugar at prices above uh, the, uh, the world market and, and provide oil at below uh, world market prices and so on, um, and, and in order to allow Cuba to finance these, these programs in healthcare and education and so on. But the consequence, unfortunately, of this was that Cuba failed to invest in industry. Uh, and didn't build up an industrial basis when uh, the Soviet aid was present. And, and the consequence of this now is that Cuba's economy is, is, is profoundly exposed to the vacillations of the, of the world market. But of course, the blockade only adds uh, you know, costs to, to, to importing and, and, and so on. It makes it far more difficult for Cuba to obtain the, the various commodities uh, that it needs. And this is in a time, of course, during a, a health crisis when more and more imports are necessary. Things like various medicines that maybe the island doesn't produce, things like syringes and so on, that it, that it, can't, uh, it can't obtain uh, from its own, uh, its own industry. And uh, you know, this was, of course, a, a campaign that was intensified by the Trump administration, which introduced 240 different measures to strangle the, the, the Cuban economy. And these have included, for instance, the preventing uh, the sending of remittances, which is an important source of, of, of hard currency for the island, uh, where, where Western Union was, was forbidden to, to, to send money to, to, to Cuba. But also, it's involved uh, the scandalous uh, like, uh, um, prevention of, of Cuban doctors being able to, to work elsewhere in Latin America. So, for instance, uh, in the Pan, the Pan uh, American Health Organization, which, by the way, is funded almost entirely by the U.S., um, there was a there was a scheme that existed which basically allowed Cuban doctors um, to to work in Brazil, and that was an important source of income uh, for the island. But America leaned on this this institution, basically saying, "Look, if you don't if you don't uh, obey, we're gonna we're gonna withdraw that funding." And so so Cuba uh, so Cuba was denied access to this this important source of revenue. Uh, Brazil basically, uh, obviously, of course, this also this also relates to the internal situation, Bolsonaro being an outright reactionary as well. Um, but this, this uh, imperialist pressure has cut off a vital source of income uh, for the island as well. But perhaps most devastating, I think, of, of all these policies of, of the blockade is the, uh, is, is the full enactment of the Helms-Burton Act of 1996, which allows the US to find companies that trade with Cuba if that happens to involve any property that was expropriated in 1960, which is, of course, the vast majority of the Cuban economy. And also prevents uh, a ship from uh, that, that's, ha that's docked in, Q in a Cuban harbor from docking in a U.S. port for 180 days, which in effect means that trading with, with Cuba will deny access uh, to, to uh, you know, several key commodities for the island and only drive up the prices of those that they do not have access to. And it should be noted that, that Biden has done absolutely nothing to reverse the policies of the Trump administration. In fact, he's threatened to intensify them. Uh, and he, he actually, uh, you know, he, he introduced 
introduce legislation, or at least call for the introduction of legislation uh, to, to, to counter the police brutality that was uh, uh, dealt out um, in, in Cuba, which is the most rank hypocrisy when you think of the police brutality that was met out in the United States in response to the Black Lives Matter movement just a year ago. But of course, this, this, isn't, this isn't all that's affecting Cuba. Another key factor in understanding the cause of this crisis is the impact of the pandemic. And this, of course, links again back to, to, to Cuba's lack of an industrial base and its reliance uh, on tourism as a key source of income. Um, now, it's worth pointing out that Trump's measures were already suffocating this uh, to a certain degree uh, because tourism was down by 20% in 2019 from the, the, the figure in 2018. But the pandemic then reduced it by a further 75% putting it almost completely to, uh, to a stop by March 2020. And, hundred, and on top of this, hundreds of thousands of Cuban workers normally engaged in economic activity were suddenly laid idle, uh, whilst the government had to continue to pay uh, their wages and provide bread rations and so on. And all of these factors basically led to, uh, the, uh, thank you, an 11% contraction in Cuba's GDP in 2020, and cut off sources of vital income for the importing of key commodities, inclu you know, including food and, and medicines. And so tourism uh, alone contributes uh, $3 billion uh, to the national income. And so if you remember back to the statistic about the amount that, uh, that they have to spend in importing food, that gives you a sense of the, again, of the, the scale of the, of the crisis. So its loss has been catastrophic at a time when, as I say, state expenditure on things to fight the pandemic has only soared. Then, of course, and this is, this is particularly important for us as revolutionaries, there is the role of the bureaucracy and how it has handled this crisis and the isolation that Cuba has faced since 1991. So I think, first off, let's deal with their immediate response to the protests, uh, which was basically to, to, to shut them down uh, with, with coercive force and to, and to implement uh, censorship and so on. And I think this is a very poor strategy on how to combat it, because such repression only lends credence to the absurd claims of imperialism uh, and so further discredits the, 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 the revolution in the eyes of the masses and so on. And importantly, now is, uh, now is the time not, for, not to, to censor the discussion on which way forward for the revolution, but to launch a very very serious campaign uh, of, of ideological rearmament on a revolutionary basis, right? This is now is the time to, to, to open these debates and discussions on a revolutionary basis for the island. And yet this is this, the precise opposite uh, was being done. Um, but it is, you know, it is, it is worth saying, it is worth, worth mentioning that um, it's to Diaz Canal's credit um, that, he, that he called on the people to come out onto the streets to defend the revolution. And I think such an act does reflect uh, the confidence that the regime has in mobilizing uh, the popular support uh, that exists and so on. Um, but I think, you know, Importantly, it must go further, right? Far more must be done, uh, which I'll come on to uh, later. And of course, the support that exists, as I say, is, is, a, is a consequence of the outstanding triumphs of the revolution. But there are longer term developments of, of bureaucratic mismanagement and the policies pursued that have brought Cuba to this situation. Um, because the Communist Party has effectively slowly introduced uh, concessions to the market since the 1990s, but particularly after 2008, uh, when Fidel resigned the presidency and the crisis of capitalism hit home that have really, really uh, worsened the situation. Now, these, these uh, measures, for instance, uh, have involved the allowing of, of small private accumulation under the guise of being uh, self-employed, particularly in hospitality to cater for tourism. In response, for instance, to the... To to the 2008 crisis that severely affected Cuba, which uh, was also in part because uh, one, of, one of the key sources of revenue for the island is also the export of nickel. Um, and so in 2007, the, the value of, of this commodity was at $50,000 a ton. And in 2008, as a result of the crisis of capitalism, this plummeted to $9,400, which gives you a sense again of the loss of revenue faced by the island. But in response to this crisis, the government laid off 500,000 workers in the state sector and encouraged them to engage in self-employment. And this formed the basis for the development of, of, of the kind of private accumulation of capital and so on, and the social differentiation that's opened up in the island. The government also began uh, the process of privatizing the housing market, allowing people to own uh, more than one home and relinquishing state control over house building. And these policies have, after decades of egalitarianism, as I say, they've, they've, uh, they've reintroduced significant social differentiation into the island and produced a kind of petty bourgeois layer whose interests are in complete contradiction to those of the revolution. And indeed, these policies have created the social basis for the protests that we saw in July.
Much more recently, in response to this latest crisis, the bureaucracy has undertaken an extensive monetary organization that takes Cuba much further down the road of capitalist restoration than at any other point since the overthrow of Batista. So to, this, this, it might get a little bit complicated here, but I'll do my best to, to outline this. So before the, this monetary reorganization, Cuba actually had two, effectively two currencies, the national peso and a convertible peso. But the, the, the key thing was that there were two different exchange rates for these currencies. So in the state sector, one national peso, which is the, the currency that it, uh, wages are paid in and so on, was equivalent to one convertible peso, um, which is the, the, the currency with which things, things are bought on the world market and so on. But in the private sector, the, the relationship was 25 pesos, national pesos were equivalent to one convertible peso. And what this means is, is that uh, it completely overvalues uh, the national peso in the state sector, um, right? It completely overvalues the strength of that currency. And what that allows for is much, much cheaper imports and it makes the, the effective wages of, of Cuban workers uh, far stronger. And so the, the, the proposal of the military organization, which has been implemented since January, uh, to eliminate these exchange rates effectively meant a major devaluing uh, of, the, of, the, of the Cuban uh, currency, of the national peso, for millions of workers, which immediately reduces the, 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 the spending power of those workers. Now, they tried to, to, to kind of stave this off with wage increases, about four times uh, a fourfold wage increase, uh, and so on, to stave off the, the, the impact of this measure, but it wasn't enough, basically, and it has led to, to, this is part of the contribution behind the inflation that has been seen in Cuba, as well as the, the, the impact of the blockade. Of course, uh, another aspect of this monetary organization is, uh, is, is also to, to, to allow for a growing role of the market in the economy. So over oh, 100 export and import contracts sign, have been signed up to by private Cuban companies. And th these companies are being allowed to obtain 80% uh, of, the, of the foreign currency that they require. And what this effectively means is it's a complete weakening of the state monopoly on foreign trade, which is a vital tool for a planned economy uh, which is unable to, uh, unable to compete with the advanced capitalist uh, economies that, uh, that, that surround it. And of course, this is very much the case for Cuba. So Lenin argued staunchly in defense of this monopoly against uh, Bukharin's proposal in the, in the midst of the Russian Revolution uh, to move towards a tariff system. And he did so precisely because opening up Russia at the time in the, in the 1920s to the penetration of capitalist commodities would have ruined the domestic industry and thus prevented socialist development. And Trotsky similarly made the point that the monopoly of foreign trade is a vitally necessary weapon for socialist construction when the capitalist countries possess a higher technique. And as I say, this is clearly the case of Cuba's relationship to the world market. <laughs> There's also been the, 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 uh, the introduction of, of something where there's going to be the folding of, of state companies that are unable uh, to, to, to obtain, uh, to become profitable after a certain transition period. There's also been the introduction of wage incentives for those companies that are able to more successfully obtain foreign currency, which will only further the social differentiation that exists on the island. And it's worth po pointing out that, that by virtue of the kind of activity that's taking place, some workers will be better placed to receive those wage incentives than others that have nothing to do with how hard they work or how efficiently they work, but just simply because of the, va you know, the, 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 the vacillations of the world market. And so this, this social differentiation will introduce uh, you know, uh, profound unfairness uh, in, in Cuban society as well, which undermines uh, the, the revolution. And, and I think you know all of these measures uh, uh, so on are, are, are catastrophic for for the island and and, and uh, set about the, a very dangerous course. In particular, uh, there's also an, another measure which uh, basically sees the the ending of universal benefits. So up to this point, uh, there, there were universal benefits that all Cubans had access to, and these are being being replaced by means tested ones, which firstly, of course, reflects the fact that uh, the, the the level of social differentiation that is open that there are those that are considered poorer than others. Um, for the first time uh, for, for many decades. Um, but, but of course, to have such a means-tested system will, again, only intensify that social differentiation, which will undermine the revolution. But of course, it, we're not we're not uh, um, you know uh, fools, if you like, to think that these concessions and so, or some concessions to the market uh, weren't necessary. But precisely because of the situation Cuba found itself in in 1991, completely isolated and cut off from the rest of the world. But of course, 
The, the problem is, is that they have not been presented as the retreat that they are. And I think it's very important to draw a comparison with the new economic policy that was pursued by, by Lenin in the 1920s, uh, which was, again, about allowing the private accumulation of capital, particularly in agriculture, and so in a clear retreat right, that, that has been imposed upon us by the delay of the world revolution. But to, you know, in the, in the Cuban example, if we look, for instance, Raúl Castro, in his speech at the Eighth Party Congress of the Cuban Communist Party, he, he made the claim that the economic and social model of socialist development requires us to have sufficient capacities to regulate the market with the greatest possible harmony through the use of indirect methods, at less and less administrative. In other words. In order to build socialism, the market must regulate economic, economic activity more and more. This is an absurd claim, of course. And tellingly, uh, a session in the run-up to that Congress um, took place between Diaz Canal, the president, and private businesses to discuss the future of the non-state, i.e. capitalist enterprises, uh, within, the, within the economy. Now again, this was presented as strengthening socialism on the island. And this is a very dangerous game being played by the Cuban government. And, and in fact, a, a group of, of communists known as Letiza commented on this in 2018 during the discussions of the new constitution that, was in, that has been put in place in 2019, um, basically commenting that uh, revolutionaries must present the situation honestly and ideologically arm the workers, not mislead them with promises that capitalist reform would guarantee socialism. And we wholeheartedly agree with this proposal. But of course, there are also very, uh, you know, long-standing issues as a consequence of bureaucratic rule, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the kind of crippling effect that it has on the economy. Because workers feel that they have no ownership over the means of production, even though that is officially the case, because they make none of the decisions. They're made from bureaucrats imposed from above. And this only uh, engenders a, a, an attitude of, of apathy uh, and so on. And it leads to, to bureaucratic mismanagement, which can't be checked. Uh, you know, there's no one that can, there's, there's no way to, to kind of regulate the, the decisions that are made and so on. Uh, and so mistakes are made and they're covered up and, the, and, the, and then they're, they're, they're redoubled and redoubled and redoubled over time, which you know, is, is a disastrous situation for the planning of an economy. And I think a real criminal example of this is the rotting of agricultural produce that's taking place in the island because of bureaucratic mismanagement. You know, food is being produced in Cuba, but then it's not being distributed. And this, is, this, this can only occur because of the malaise and the apathy that is a product of bureaucratic mismanagement. And such a phenomena could and should be corrected immediately with workers' control, um, which would see the workers have real ownership over the, the decision-making processes. Thanks. So what has transpired since these protests in Cuba then? The government has, has effectively uh, attempted to offer concessions to the people, but also continue to make concessions to the market. Um, but has also importantly tried to combine this with, with tours of working class areas in order to hear the complaints and establish a dialogue. In terms of medicines, one of the measures, for instance, in terms of measure, uh, medicines, they've eliminated customs charges on imports uh, for personal consumption, um, which, is, which is obviously a, a significant relief for, for, for Cubans in, in such a period. But more importantly, they've hastily rushed through the legalizing of small and medium uh, uh, enterprises, basically private companies uh, on the island. And as I say, this path can only strengthen the forces of reaction. And the bureaucracy is conjuring up forces that it cannot control, despite the best of intentions. But I think as well, uh, an important question for Marxists isn't just the, the hard economic facts, but also how these have impacted consciousness uh, and, and the general mood that exists in society. Now, of course, we can't be ex uh, absolutely exact about uh, this important question, but certain things have indicated the mood. So as I said, there's a, amongst a broad layer of the population, there is a sense of malaise uh, that things need to change. And this has been the case uh, for, for a prolonged period. In fact, in 2011, uh, Renaud uh, uh, Lambert, a journalist, uh, noted that this February, workers at a clinic in central Havana met to discuss uh, the, the lineamientos, which were proposals to introduce market reforms. Its 291 proposals include performance-based pay, legalizing market prices, and a review of social programs. The document was approved unanimously in just a few minutes. But the workers stressed their attachment to Cuba's health and education systems. Some things should change 
but not those. And in my conversations with Cubans in, in 2018 when I visited the island, this was a familiar formulation. The idea that capitalism can be slowly introduced <laughs> and restored, but socialized healthcare and education be maintained. But this is a utopia. But what this importantly reflects uh, is not just uh, you know, the, the malaise that exists uh, and that has set in, but also importantly, the, the fact that this, the, the, the fall in political consciousness on the island as well, that has taken place over a protracted period as a, failure, as a result of the failures of the, of the revolutionary government to, to wage an ideological struggle as well. There are also in, uh, influential institutions, such as the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy, that articulate a clearly pro-capitalist line. Uh, Omar Eveleni, uh, a Cuban economist, has talked up in the Havana Times the adoption of the Chinese or Vietnamese model, which of course means the restoration of capitalism. Likewise, Juan Triana uh, Cordobi and, and Ricardo Torres Perez of the same institute openly celebrate uh, Cuba's move towards restoring cap uh, capitalism with, with various reforms that expanded the non-state sector. This section of society is of course undoubtedly hopeful uh, of what such reforms uh, and the restoration of capitalism would mean for their position in society as salary professionals. But there's also an aspect that their ideological perspective is informed entirely by their disconnection from the real economy, simply analyzing it rather than being actively a part of it. But within the more the politically active layer in the Communist Party, there are also various trends. There is, of course, a right wing uh, that is looking to emulate, as I say, this, the, the Vietnamese or, or the Chinese way with more and more market reforms. But this is by no means the only mood within the bureaucracy and the party. There's also an important left wing that exists and is becoming increasingly vocal and is even being voiced in official channels of the state. Uh, the Communist Party paper, for instance, Granma, which is named after the, the, the small boat that ferries uh, along the, the, the guerrilla fighters of the July 26th movement in 1956, um, put on a very uh, interesting article in May 2020. Uh, this was titled, The Neoliberal Goodness of Zealous Advisors. And it was an attack on those who prescribed capitalist restoration as a solution to Cuba's ills. And it makes the salient point that the world capitalist system uh, you know, is, is currently going into, into the, its worst crisis for, for uh, centuries. And so why is it that we're rushing to, to join this, this, this crisis? Um, Interestingly enough, uh, in response to this article, a right-wing economist, uh, Pedro Monreal, wrote uh, in, in his blog that those opposed to the development of small and medium enterprises are better off going to the big leagues and reading Trotsky in the left opposition. And of course, we can only agree with this. But outside of the official structures, there are many blogs and small groupings of all different political shades that are discussing which way forward for Cuba. And uh, I want to comment on some of the, uh, the left-wing ones. So as I mentioned, there's this group Latiza, which is a particular interest, because they've written several articles um, as communists in opposition to bureaucracy and recommending workers' control as a solution. Indeed, they've been uh, prompted by the protests of July 11 to be more openly critical of, of the bureaucracy and put forward a six-point program that includes measures on redistributing wealth gained by corruption, workers' control, and the redirection of investment from tourism to more vital industries like agriculture. Importantly, they raise the need for the popular involvement of the workers in political and economic decisions as the main way to resolve the crisis in Cuba. Interestingly, they talk about going beyond support for progressive governments uh, in, in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and for Cuba to link up with anti-capitalist movements. Now, of course, this formulation can be sharper, but it's a very positive sign that they're looking to, to an internationalist uh, foreign policy, which is absolutely vital. Another group called Mass Socialism or More Socialism uh, that, is, that was set up around uh, the discussions of the Eighth Party Congress of the Communist Party uh, professes to be a group of militant youth that have also formulated a program with workers' control as a central feature. And uh, Lester Pro, one of the main organizers of the group, has articulated that it is not enough to condemn Yankee imperialism, uh, but you also must criticize the mistakes made by the government to, cri to criticize bureaucracy from a revolutionary standpoint. Uh, and we, again, we, we can only agree. And so clearly there is also a, a conscious and active left in Cuba that is the basis for leading Cuba out of this, of this crisis in a revolutionary direction. And so this, this brings me on to my final point, which is which way forward for the revolution in Cuba? Now, of course, I think one, one thing that we would argue for is the freedom of, of expression for all revolutionaries to, to, to debate the which way forward for, for, for the revolution. That is absolutely vital. But it must be coupled with an ide a campaign of ideological rearmament. So Raul Castro's central speech, which I mentioned before, 
made this point on several occasions. And notably, he said, it is necessary to raise the revolutionary militancy and intransigence and strengthen its contribution to ideological work, the confrontation with the enemy's subversive plans and the creation and consolidation of values. But of course, we welcome this, of course, but it must go beyond an eloquent speech in front of the Communist Party. It should be the priority of the party itself to wage a campaign of education within its own ranks and for these cadres to carry out work in the mass organizations and in the workplaces and so on. The party should not shirk ideological battles that lie ahead. And we welcome uh, the decision of the party to put forward a clear proposal uh, for the new family code challenging the reactionary position of the evangelical churches that marriage is between a man and a woman. And this frank ideological confrontation must not just be confined to, to the, this question of the family code, but it must be uh, repeated on all the vital questions affecting the course of the revolution. And indeed, this ideological rearmament is all the more important in the context of plans of the counter-revolution to hold a demonstration on the 15th of November. So this demonstration was initially actually planned to be on the 20th because it was a deliberate reference uh, to the Velvet Revolution that overthrew the planned economy in Czechoslovakia. And this demo is, is, is being organized by forces that are known to be connected uh, openly uh, uh, to the counter-revolution uh, and terrorist organizations in Miami uh, and so on. And, and what we say to this is that police repression will not win this struggle. The masses must be mobilized to defend the revolution, but this can only be achieved with open revolutionary discussion. And of course there is, and we agree with, the, with those, those communists that are, that are struggling in Cuba, that there is a real need for genuine workers' control over industries and over the mass organizations, for, for instance, like the CTC, the, the, the National Trade Union Confederation. In 2010, Frank uh, um, Jose Salar uh, Cabrales, a history professor in, in the Universidad de Oriente, stated that for the Cuban revolution, an internationalist policy is not only a moral obligation uh, or a tradition, it is also a question of survival. And this is absolutely correct. Thank you. The spreading of the revolution beyond the boundaries of Cuba, this is an absolutely vital task. And of course, uh, you know, there are, there are myriad opportunities. And I would recommend that all those interested in the future of the Cuban revolution go along to the talk, uh, which is on, on, on tomorrow, I believe, on, on the revolution in Latin America, because this, these two questions are inextricably linked. But it's important that the Cuban Revo Revolution plays, plays a decisive role in this. For instance, they ca there can be no repeat of the, the disastrous mistakes that were made in the Bolivarian Revolution, where basically the, the, the Cuban Revolution advised Hugo Chavez to hold back, not to carry out the expropriation of capitalist property, saying, basically saying, look, it was the 1960s, things were different, now you can't, now you can't do this sort of thing. This, is, this has been a, a disaster because that has paved the way for the crisis that afflicts uh, Venezuela today, that the failure to carry out a successful revolution to carry it out to its completion. And so Cuba must adopt a, a clearly revolutionary pro, uh, uh, policy that actually calls for the overthrow of capitalism uh, uh, in, in any uh, situation in, in Latin America and the world. This is, this is of vital importance. And in a much more recent article, about Latin American unity, published on, uh, on the 20, 26th of September in Granma, again, the, the official party of the Communist Party. Again, the same Cabrales makes the case that we need to articulate the struggles of all the oppressed peoples with a revolutionary leadership that identifies capitalism as the main and common enemy and concentrates all its energies against it. And it is this revolutionary leadership that is everywhere lacking and that must be built. Only the spread of the Cuban revolution can guarantee its survival. Thank you, comrades.